Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to thank Steel Point uh, Spaces, uh, the opportunity, and also uh, Ellie and the rest of participants for the interest in this talk. Uh, my name is uh, Marta Uteda. I am a, a plastic uh, reconstructive and aesthetic surgeon in Madrid, where I live, and I also do analog collage in my free time. Amazing. And um, now it's me. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you again as well to Masha and Alex and the Still Point team for having me and to Marta as well for letting me gate crash your collage talk. Um, I have a very, it's not a hard act to follow because I'm going first, but I, Marta is a literal plastic surgeon and an incredible artist and I just have some thoughts to share with you. So um, apologies in advance, because this is going to be a fairly self indulgent uh, chat, because that's what most of philosophy is. Um, and also because um, my journey with enthusiasm has been really, really tied up with learning more about myself. Um, so apologies in advance for that. And also, um, it's going to be quite in part etymological, uh, because one thing I'm really enthusiastic about is words. Um, so just to kind of flag it there. Um, having said that, I haven't told you who I am. So <laughs> I'm Ellie, I run a business called The Enthusiast, um, which is a lifestyle brand platform um, to encourage people to be more enthusiastic. It's because I felt like the world had lots to say, not very nice things either about people who are enthusiastic, that they're either pathetic or uh, snowflakes, um, embarrassing. I just felt like there wasn't much support for people who just love things, love life, want to talk about those things. So it's real kind of in a meta way, it's a real honor to come and talk to you about enthusiasm tonight because it is something I am very enthusiastic about. Um, and I do that via um, kind of merch. I've got t-shirts and sweatshirts um, and also I'm just launching a magazine as well for enthusiasts. So kind of a no judgment zone for enthusiasm is my kind of bag. So without further ado, um, I told you I was going to be etymological. So we'll start with an enthusiasm definition. Um, and the dictionary definition is intense enjoyment, interest or approval and a great eagerness to be involved in a particular activity which you enjoy or which you think is important. Um, the reason I like to use definitions in this kind of work is because I don't know about you, um, but enthusiasm to me still conjures up a very specific image, very particularly an American high school cheerleader in a 90s film waving some pom poms and two, four, six, eighting her way out of any situation. Uh, as you can tell, that's not <laughs> I've gone from more of a 70s ski vibe today. Not quite sure what that is, uh, but it's definitely not a two, four, six, eight cheerleader. Um, and whilst this is, of course, one one way that enthusiasm can present itself, um, enthusiasm can also be really quiet, it can be really inward and it can be really solitary. And one of the things that I'm uh, really keen to do with my platform is to make everyone feel welcome within enthusiasm. Um, I think there's a really common misconception that enthusiasm is only the domain of the extroverted and actually introverts are some of the most solidly enthusiastic people I know. Um, I also put this definition up because there are, to me, it flags kind of two different types of enthusiasm, which I talk about in my work. So the first one is just kind of like a more general sense of enthusiasm, a kind of joie de vivre, a get up and go, whatever you want to call it. And the second one is kind of more hobby related. So more about having something you are enthusiastic about. And this is why I'm so excited to listen to Marty's talk later, because I have no hobbies. <laughs> I am exceptionally enthusiastic, but I have no hobbies and I never have done. Um, so for ages, I didn't associate myself with enthusiasm because it wasn't a term that I could use for myself in the way that you might call somebody a sports enthusiast or a car enthusiast, say. Um, Complete side note, not something I've got the time to talk about today, but I love talking about this, one of my favourite topics. Um, enthusiasm is incredibly gendered, um, and I think it's really interesting that the first couple of things that might come to your mind are, you know, as I said, sports and automobiles, both very typically traditionally male domains. Um, and I think it's just something I personally am really interested in um, because the way we view enthusiasm between the genders is completely, uh, the kind of binary genders, um, is completely different. Um, you know, you need to, all you need to do is take a stadium full of screaming football fans and compare it to teenagers screaming at One Direction 
same vibe, very different um, interpretations. But anyway, back to me. <laughs> um, so I set up The Enthusiast in 2017 um, and it came off the back of me setting up another business um, in uh, copywriting in, in the wedding industry. Um, I set that up kind of in between leaving, uh, finishing my final year exams and leaving uni. Um, and I set it up and I was very lucky. I had a lot of support, but also a lot of people saying, don't you think it's a bit weird that you're so obsessed with weddings when you're 21? Um, and I also got some people saying, do you think it's because your parents are divorced? You are all psychologists, I am not, so you can kind of work that one out for yourselves. Um, but I didn't think it was weird that I was enthusiastic about weddings. It wasn't something I'd ever kind of given much thought to, um, because it's just always the way I have been. Um, and that's what set the enthusiast off, because it got me thinking, well, why is it unusual? Why is it strange? Why is it vilified? Um, all of these questions um, that led me to set up The Enthusiast and kind of seek out my people. Um, now, you might be wondering, what, what was that degree? Um, it wasn't wedding planning. It wasn't enthusiasm. Uh, it was actually philosophy, ironically. Um, it's been the source of great amusement from anyone who knew me at uni that I have been billed as a philosopher for this talk today, because that's a very generous interpretation of real life. I hated my degree so much, I tried to drop out two or three times. Um, I was just saying to Masha before the event started, it's the kind of topics I love to discuss with people over a pint at the pub, um, but I just didn't like the way it was kind of taught to me. But actually coming back to that topic today has been a really, really lovely welcome surprise because uh, actually philosophy and enthusiasm are so intertwined um, in ways that I didn't quite appreciate at the time when I was slogging through um, essays. But actually there's, there are mu it's a much broader kind of spectrum than I never ever really appreciated. So I'm really excited to kind of be chatting to you about that today. Um, also, there's a real caveat here that I, um, I'm only going to talk about Western philosophy because I don't have any scope on Eastern philosophy. So if anybody does have anything that they kind of know of that is, is relevant in the Eastern kind of philosophy spheres or different practices, I would love to know more about that because it's a real passion interest of mine and I simply don't have the um, knowledge levels on it yet. So if you do have anything that you want to throw my way, I would love to chat more about that later. So philosophy is basically just lots of history of people's different thoughts <laughs> that is what it is um so the first kind of the, the the etymological origin of the word enthusiasm is actually in religion so it came via the late latin enthusiasmus which was an inspiration or a frenzy which came from the greek enthusiasmos sorry if there are any greek speakers also sorry if there are any latin speakers though i think that's probably less likely um and basically it means to be possessed or inspired by a god um, in ancient philosophy, Plato and Aristotle both talk about enthusiasm in this way. Um, there's Plato and Aristotle in a picture I particularly enjoyed because they've got a selfie stick and Xboxes. Not quite sure why that's a thing, but I'm very happy about it all the same. Um, and so Plato or Socrates uh, contrasted enthusiasm with knowledge and technique. Um, he prioritised the latter two because they can be taught, because they can be harnessed, because they can be learned and crafted, as opposed to enthusiasm, which was kind of seen as a bit indulgent and a bit un unharnessable, really, and unusable. Um, he also posited it as the flip side of melancholy um, in the theory of humours. So if you know about the theory of humours, it was kind of the belief that everything was about balance in the body. It was like different liquids, um, <clears throat> pleasingly not. Uh, enthusiasm and melancholy were in the domain of black bile. So the idea was if you had too much black bile, you were really melancholy. If you didn't have any black bile or not enough, then you were just frenzied. And then there was a middle point, interestingly, where if you had just enough melancholy, you had a kind of state of euphoria and real inspiration. Um, in the Problemata, one of Aristotle's students actually asks why so many philosophers, poets and pol politicians are melancholy. Um, so there was a real idea at that time that great statesmen and artists and creators and the kind of genii of their time were melancholy and enthusiastic. Um, it then, after that, philosophy has a very on-off relationship with enthusiasm. So in the Renaissance, which is why I've got the birth of Venus here, uh, enthusiasm became a kind of carte blanche for crazy artists to just do whatever they wanted with artistic license. Um, the idea was that they were so divinely inspired and that they kind of understood things that we mere mortals wouldn't understand. And so enthusiasm was kind of used as a bit of a like, yeah, sure, Michelangelo's like mental, but also look what he can do. Um, and then Martin Luther, you can see 
uh, at the bottom, he denounced enthusiasm um, and he basically called some enthusiastic like sectors of the church. Again, sorry if there are German, German speakers, sorry, Masha. Um, but like Schwärmer, which kind of basically meant like a, a mob, like buzzing enthusiastic bees, but it wasn't used in like a positive collaborative term. It was like a swarm, basically like mob mentality. Then Adam Smith, who's in the bottom corner, um, he kind of was one of the proponents of enthusiasm becoming medicalized. So it was something that needed to be cured. Um, Adam Smith himself said that science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. So the idea was that uh, science is rational, it's logical, it's intelligent, enthusiasm is emotional, um, you know, kind of impulsive and to be avoided at all costs, basically. Um, some of the kind of ways of curing it were interesting. One of them was to read more, which if your enthusiasm is reading, I'm not sure is going to cure you of the enthusiasm, but there we are. Um, after that, it then became a political thing. It created with fanaticism and uh, kind of riots in, in a way. Uh, so in the 18th century, enthusiasm became a social sin um, because it was not proper. Um, and this is kind of one of the theories is this is why organized sport and leisure became a thing um, because it was introduced to kind of stop riots and revolutions and to give people an outlet for their enthusiasm. Um, Norbert Elias has a lot to say about kind of how sport was used to civilize people. And there's a lot tied up here as well in the idea that enthusiasm was kind of thought as, as I said before, kind of a, an impulsive, more uh, physical thing as opposed to kind of higher realm. So there was a lot of kind of like class judgments bound up in that as well, uh, as there always is with anything in history, really. Finally, which is kind of bringing us to present day, it became corporate. So at kind of your enthusiasm for work, an entrepreneurial spirit, a passion within your kind of the corporate sphere. Uh, interestingly, you might not kind of associate this with him, but if you Google quotes about enthusiasm, one of the top hits you get is Henry Ford. <laughs> um, he said he had some really poetic things to say, to be fair to him. One of them being, uh, enthusiasm is the yeast that makes your hopes shine to the stars, which I didn't know he had in him. Um, but there we are. Henry Ford obviously was the creator of the five day working week. He kind of was a massive part of kind of capitalism and the revolutionized uh, industry. And so in enthusiasm kind of became a massive part of that. And then finally, kind of to bring us to kind of present day, there's Tony Robbins at the bottom. Um, and enthusiasm has kind of almost come full circles, kind of taken on a religious tone. Uh, you know, people going to an event, seeing somebody speak with great enthusiasm and then going away and kind of spreading the gospel, whether it's, uh, you know, it's just been swapped out from religious gospel to sales gospel or marketing chat or kind of toxic positivity, whatever that kind of your thought is. Um, Tony Robbins annoys me, so I'm going to move on to Mary Oliver, which is much nicer. Um, but the reason that I kind of wanted to give this overview of philosophy um, is because I think, and, and kind of philosophical slant on enthusiasm, is because they are both, to me, about the same thing. And that is not to be too grandiose for a Thursday evening, but I think they're both about the meaning of life. <laughs> um, I think that they, that's what enthusiasm is. It, to me, it's what makes life worth living. It's kind of what you feel drawn to. Uh, it's what you want to shout out from the rooftops. It's not necessarily easy to box in or define. Um, you know, for some people, it might feel like a real fire. To some people who are calmer, it might feel like a real flow state. Um, but it is, that's kind of why I've been so surprised now that I'm out of the uni uh, bubble and can look back on it to, to think about the incredible parallels between philosophy and enthusiasm. Um, so, Sometimes it's easy to define enthusiasm by what it's not. Um, so it's not the toxic positivity that we see on Instagram. It's not good vibes or love and light, no bad vibes, no bad thoughts. Um, what it is, and I think this has been particularly pertinent these past few years, kind of from March last year, because when we went into lockdown, I thought, how am I gonna run a business about enthusiasm in a pandemic? <laughs> um, and actually what enthusiasm is, is acknowledging that some things are terrifying some are awful uh, and some are really really scary but we have things that we love and that's how and why we keep going um it's about something bigger than ourselves which i think is philosophy's entire kind of bag um and it's about divorcing achievement from purpose as well for me um and that's why i've brought brilliant mary oliver onto the screen 
Um, at the end of her poem, The Summer's Day, um, she asks, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. This poem has kind of taken on a world of its own. You can see it all over Etsy. It's in uh, Cheryl Stride's book, Wild. Um, there's also a Harvard Business School uh, competition, basically, where you answer this question. Um, and it's funny because, especially with the Harvard Business School, Kind of applications it's often interpreted to mean you need to achieve more how are you going to maximize your time maximize your output and maximize your productivity uh, but this is why i said about enthusiasm not being about kind of being about uh divorcing achievement um from purpose because mary oliver actually you'll notice as, as the full thing she spends seven lines of this poem talking about a grasshopper like she was not saying this with the intention of everyone being fully you know 5 a.m to 3 a.m work schedules her her whole bag was um yeah strolling idly noticing things more and also uh, somebody asked her in an interview what what she thinks she did with her one wild and precious life and she said i learned to love and be loved um which i think is a big part of enthusiasm and why it's so great um, and I love this example as well, because enthusiasm can be something huge, it can be world peace, it can be climate change, uh, or it can be something tiny, it can be a grasshopper in a field near you, it can be a particular um, item that you love baking, it can be any, I mean we all had that with sourdough last year, right? <laughs> um, and this is why my slogan is uh, celebrating enthusiasm in the extraordinary and the everyday, because I think we talk about enthusiasm so often in the kind of massive, you know, world leader kind of change the world domains and whilst that is wonderful and we couldn't do that without enthusiasm I also think we need to focus on it in the everyday as well so this is where hobbies come into it as I said before I have no hobbies uh when I was younger I never really had anything that I did constantly I was terrible at sport terrible at music and all I did was I went to school and I worked and I did my homework and I saw friends but that doesn't really count as a hobby um so I never really thought of myself as an enthusiast, um, but, but I do think hobbies are something that I've learned as I've gotten older, um, that hobbies are obviously really important. They give you such an outlet for creativity, for enthusiasm, for expressing yourself. Um, and obviously this is what Marta will chat more about in a minute. Um, and this brings me on to my kind of final point, which is about why, just a, a quick note really about why I believe enthusiasm is gonna make us is this the key to making us a kind of society really? Because there is so much subconscious slash unconscious, I can never remember the difference. Usually I get away with it in a room full of psychologists, I know I won't, so sorry, whichever one it is, you know what I mean. Um, so much judgment on people for, for being enthusiastic about different things. And you might be sat there thinking, no, I don't judge anyone for that. I bet you do because really loaded words that we think of every day. Like, have you ever called somebody basic, especially around this time of year, like pumpkin spice latte season? Have you ever called a girl a basic? Um, have you ever called somebody too much? Have you ever called them over the top? Uh, embarrassing? Have you ever called them a nerd or a geek? Um, obviously some of these words can be used um, positively, um, but those words are at root judging somebody for what they like. Uh, and for liking something that's different to you. We ascribe so much importance to what people like, what they're enthusiastic about and what they devote their time to. Um, but actually, I just really think that unless somebody's enthusiasm is obviously hurting somebody or is damaging or harmful, um, we could do well to kind of step back and just allow them their joy and focus on our own. Um, and also ask ourselves like, why is that rubbing me up the wrong way? <laughs> and what is it about that that's setting something off in me? Uh, and I just think awareness of this, I, and as I say, like, this is not a preachy, I'm perfect kind of thing. Uh, I, I catch myself every day thinking, finding new words. I'm like, wait, why, what, Ellie, no. Um, and so I really do think that enthusiasm, giving everyone more space to um, be, kind of spend their time how they, want to do the things that they love will kind of make a much kinder society and hopefully happier people which is obviously the main the main point um so there we are no pressure uh i think enthusiasm can change the world do you take the pledge with me um and now i will stop sharing my screen because i'm delighted to hand it over to marta <laughs> hello i'm gonna share this. Hello. Can you see uh, uh, the screen? Okay. 
Um, I would like uh, to talk about how I started uh, doing collage and how it works for me as a tool to explore um, the world through a different uh, perspective. And in this context, uh, André Breton uh, and his surrealist uh, manifest uh, was very inspiring to me. And uh, here you can see the, the, the book cover illustration by René Magritte, which is uh, one of my favorite artists. Uh, and uh, he's known for his witty and provocative images, uh, which uh, with which he intended uh, to change the preconditioned uh, perception of reality and force the viewer um, to become hypersensitive to, to the surroundings. Uh, Breton, uh, André Breton, uh, is known for being a writer, a poet, a, a essayist, uh, and founder of the surrealist movement, but he also began to study uh, medicine, ignoring uh, family pressures that uh, wanted him to become an engineer. And he came in contact uh, with the world of art, uh, first through Paul Valéry and after uh, through the, the Dadaist uh, group in 1916. And uh, during the First World War, uh, it's interesting that he worked in psychiatric hospitals uh, where he studied the work uh, of Sigmund Freud, uh, which uh, the one he, he got, got to know, and his experiments with automatic writing, uh, which influenced uh, uh, his formulation of the surrealist uh, theory. And the Breton Manifest of the Surrealism is therefore inspired by Freud's book, The Interpretations of Dreams, uh, where the exploration of the unconscious uh, revealed the hidden feelings and desires uh, hidden in the dreams. Uh, according to uh, his theory, uh, the creativity that arose from the artist unconscious was more powerful and authentic than that derived, derived from the consciousness. Uh, so the objective um, was reaching an automatism uh, in artistic creation in, in some way as breathing or blinking are automatic uh, without limits and without the reason of control. Uh, sorry, be, be, without the, the reason control in, in an attempt to achieve uh, the greatest possible uh, spontaneity. And uh, this is made through the relationship of everyday objects uh, that normally have nothing to do with each other uh, that causes a disturbance in the subject's uh, perception and thus stimulates the unconscious. Uh, there is a juxtaposition like you will see um, afterwards in, in the collage uh, between uh, familiar and common objects uh, and the improbably and absurd uh, in a way um, are connected uh, and the, the scenario is imposed to the object. So, um, um, I don't know, this doesn't, up oh, here, yeah, sorry. Uh, my start doing, doing, doing collage as a plastic surgeon, uh, something that might be, uh, that had nothing to do, but uh, in my way of thinking has something to do, uh, still the, from my point of view. So uh, in my start, I start doing analog collage uh, like seven years ago, and I have, I have had always an interest uh, in art. Uh, and in that moment, uh, the need of a different way of, of expression that fused uh, art and science uh, arose in me in a way that I could achieve the freedom that surgery lacked. So in my creative uh, process, um, there is a surrealist influence as I have just mentioned before. And at the same time, I can find similarities and, and difference, differences uh, with uh, uh, plastic uh, surgery. Um, in the creative uh, process, uh, my inspiration comes uh, from concepts, uh, words, science, uh, mythology, books, music, or sometimes all together at the same time. And there is no established order. Most of the times collages are made before doing any research or before even knowing their meaning to me or the story behind them. And uh, sometimes it happens the other way around. The idea comes first and, and then after it comes the collage. 
Other times there are just visual or aesthetic uh, collages that uh, have an open interpretation. The imagination, my imagination always plays a, also an important role. And regarding the materials I use, I use all the new papers and, and also um, uh, pieces of uh, cloth, uh, rope, etc., using different bases or support materials as paper or, or tiles that I find in flea markets uh, when I travel. Berlin, I must admit, has been an important source of all of them, and uh, in my hometown, Madrid, too. So in all these materials, uh, for me, underlies the concept of the founded object uh, described uh, by Marcel Duchamp, because I consider there are they are kind of lost and then after found. And therefore, during the process of, of, of its use in the collage, they have the opportunity of having like a second life, usually in a different way than they were initially meant to be or, or with a different, a different meaning. And the technique for me has something to do with surgery, surgical technique too, because the instrument I use for collage making are scalpel, scissors, sometimes forceps for small pieces of old uh, delicate papers. And it's also required precision and uh, detail and research. Uh, the concept of uh, cut and um, paste uh, from plastic surgery is uh, present as an act of uh, reconstruction. In this sense, uh, one of my connections to the city of Berlin is, is the fact that I find very interesting all that it's uh, abandoned, old or broken, and therefore the connection between architecture, collage, plastic surgery and reconstruction in general. My feeling uh, while doing collage and after uh, uh, is that uh, in collage, in contrast, to plastic surgery, mistake, uh, mistakes or failures are permitted because mistakes or failures don't really exist. They are only opportunities. An error can become a fundamental piece of work and randomness exists versus the fixed reality. There is freedom and chance and the way of perception of, of, perception of reality changes through the combination of elements as in a dream or a hallucination. So now uh, I would like to show to show for for collage and and my interpretations that uh, might be sometimes a little bit complicated, but they 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 are I think they are interesting, and um, see what you think about them. <laughs> this uh, first uh, collage uh, is called the trans differentiation of Medusa. And it's about the relationship between the Greek uh, legend of Medusa and its real counterpart in nature, which is a very special type of jellyfish. Medusa's name in ancient Greek means the guardian and protector, but in Spanish, it, it also means jellyfish. Uh, she was daughter of Forces and Seto, and she was a beautiful mortal, the most beautiful of her sisters and guarded the temple of Athena. Medusa's beauty captivated men and God, including uh, Poseidon himself, a god of the seas who took her by force in the very temple of the goddess Athena. Athena, very angry at the desecration of her secret place, as punishment made Medusa's her sprout vipers, and despite having been a victim of Poseidon, she turned her into monster, who had the curse of turning into stone anyone who looked at her straight in the eye. According to the legend, Perseus murdered Medusa, cutting her head off. And after a long journey, the, uh, blood, of, the blood of Medusa was saved only, uh, the also only the gods could use it. Since it was known that the blood that flowed from the left vein had a deadly poison, but the blood from the right vein had the power to heal and even resurrect the dead. In a similar way as Medusa's blood uh, could resurrect the dead, there is another jellyfish, which is called a very complicated name, to Turritopsis dorni, jellyfish, that can resurrect itself. In adverse conditions, or so when it suffers a significant injury, it returns to the seabed and becomes a polyp again, or what is the same, it returns to infantile state. Thanks to this process, the cells that are needed at all times to stay alive can be created. Theoretically, this cycle can be repeated indefinitely, giving this jellyfish the status of potential biological immortality. Now I'm gonna show you 
this uh, next collage, which is called Amanita muscaria, the agaric fly, which is another name of the Amanita muscaria, Soma and Christmas. This collage is about the Amanita muscaria lysergic mas mushroom and its historical counterpart in the concept of Soma and in the origin of the figure of Santa Claus. In the 18th century, a Swedish military officer who spent 12 years in Siberia as a prisoner of war reported that shamans of some tribes in the region, such as the Koryaks of the Kamchatka Peninsula, used the Amanita muscaria uh, or so agaric fly in Latin as an hallucinogen. Most investigations conclude that the figure of Santa Claus der derives from the, these Siberian shamans who uh, collected the sacred mushroom Amanita muscaria, dried it, and gave it to their people as a gift on the winter solstice. They even describe how they often use the opening in the roof of the yards to deliver this precious and magical gift uh, when the snow of the region would have already blocked the doors of the houses. Hence, the shaman, now Santa Claus, uses the chimneys. In fact, the winter solstice was a very special time in the annual cycle, celebrated by many cultures as the arrival of the light, even during the Neolithic period, therefore the Christmas lightning. The red and white clothing of Santa Claus also has its, its origin in the shamans of those regions who dressed in red and white, embodying the image of the mushroom itself. Even the tradition of placing gifts under Christmas tree is related to these magic mushrooms as they tend to grow under, uh, under evergreen trees such as fir and beech. On the other hand, the adjective muscaria comes from the Latin musca, which is fly in Spanish mosca, because the insects that interact with this fungus are paralyzed for a short period of time. Soma uh, was the name that the inhabitants of ancient India gave to the juice that they extracted from a plant that according to the holy book Rig Veda allowed them to get drunk to perform their religious ceremonies during which they dance under the influence of this psychoactive substance. However, the identity of the Soma plant remained uh, one of the enigmas of et ethnobotany for more than 2000 years. And only in 1968, uh, interdisciplinary stud studies showed with the strong evidence that the sacred narcotic of the ancient Hindis uh, was mushroom, the Amanita muscaria. Also, uh, the writer Aldous Huxley, who knew well the ancient traditions, gave the name Soma to the drug taken by the characters in his novel Brave New World, published in 1932, with which people in the novel managed to calm down, forget their daily, day, daily problems, and escape from reality when they need it, presumably without any side effect. Therefore, there uh, is no doubt that Huxley's name for this seemingly perfect drug influenced the decision of the company Meda Pharmaceuticals to patent the drug whose active ingredient is carisoprodol under, under, under the brand name Soma. So, lots of information under the Amanita Muscaria, Christmas, and Soma. This next collage is called the Inner Labyrinth. This collage is inspiring uh, Aruki Murakami book, Kafka uh, on the Shore, which if you haven't had the opportunity to read, I highly recommend you to do so. It's about the labyrinth concept, uh, the inner and the outer ones. The labyrinth has its origin in the ancient Mesopotamic cultures. They had a great admiration for the complex complexity of the intestines, all uh, that which, uh, for, um, uh, which rip from animals and sometimes also for, from humans in rituals to predict the future according to their shape. So the shape of the labyrinth refers to our entrails in a way that the principle of the labyrinth resides within our own interior and corresponds with the external labyrinths as a reciprocal metaphor. The concept uh, of life, death, and resurrection a cycle represented for various cultures of the ancient world the dynamics of life and found its practical example in the nutritional act. Food, which is dead, formerly a living being, it uh, was introduced into the digestive tract 
which is the labyrinth or the spiral. And there it was transformed to finally become part of the living organisms, which is the resurrection. For these people, intestine, intestinal transit was the very image of the magic of life and the metaphor of re renewal and change. On the other hand, the idea of a spiritual development as the result of overcoming a path of obstacles led to take the image of the labyrinths as symbols of caves or the, intensi the intensities of the earth, considered the gates to the underworld. Entering a labyrinth meant, on, the, on one hand, taking risk, but on the other, the possibility of emerging magnified by the test passed. The corridors of the labyrinth represented both the test that life gives us uh, through our existence, the outer labyrinth, and the psychological journey that we have to overcome until reaching the center of ourselves, the inner labyrinth, in order to be able to successfully accomplish our task in life. In Western culture, there are many stories which uh, the main characters emerge from labyrinths or guts uh, that uh, were the test. Uh, Theseus in the famous labyrinth of Minotaur, Little Red Riding Hood coming out from the wolf, uh, as, and many more. So the symbolism of the intestinal um, is sublimated under the image of the labyrinth and also appears in the development of uh, folk dances with choreographies based on circular movements. In religious pilgrimages, in the labyrinths drawn on the floor of medieval cathedrals such as Ain Amiens or Chartres, as well as in certain board games such as the Game of the Coast and in the design of various amulets. And this is the, the last uh, collage. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, talk about my personal interpretation and it's called mesmerizing because the adjective uh, mesmerizing comes from the 18th century physician, Fran Anton Mesmer. He was considered by some a pioneer of psychiatry and by others a mere charlatan and he studied theology, philosophy, law uh, and law before studying medicine in Vienna. Through his theory of animal magnetism, he discovered the power of hypnotic suggestion for the treatment of various diseases, a concept that later Pierre Janet, Sigmund Freud, and Joseph Brower used to study important points in modern secretary as the influence of ideas, beliefs, desires, and fears in the transformation of the bodies, the relationship of these ideas with the placebo or nocebo effects in medicine, and uh, also the relationship with mental illnesses, su such as dissociative identity disorders or conversion disorders, such as hysteria. Now I'm gonna show you the gallery where you can relax, see other collages. And if you have any desire of commenting any of them, you just can tell.
we are going to repeat them again in case you want to take notes or the numbers. I think, Marta, I'm not sure if you saw that someone wants, um, someone's asked if you can comment on number two. Two, okay. Yeah, uh, this one um, is uh, about uh, Proteus uh, syndrome uh, and um, it's about the disease and also the story of the person uh, behind uh, this uh, process that was described after him. Uh, let me one minute because these are uh, complicated notes and I will let you know the, the, the rest of the information. Um, this proteus syndrome, uh, it's a syndrome where the bone uh, grows and the skin grows. So the person uh, is disfigured. Um, and uh, this person was uh, a real person. Uh, he was called Joseph Curry Merrick, uh, and he was known as the Elephant Man and became, fa became uh, famous due to the terrible malformations that he suffered from the year and a half of age. And uh, he was condemned to spend most of his life working in circuses. Uh, he only found peace at his last years of life. And uh, for most of uh, his life, it was assumed that he did not have outstanding and intelligence, but he was later shown to have above average intelligence. He suffered this proteus syndrome I was talking about before, um, which we could represent the most serious case known to date. The proteus syndrome is a congenital disease that causes excessive uh, skin growth and abnormal bone development, and it is usually accompanied, accompanied by tumors in the upper half of the body. The name of the condition alludes to Greek god Proteus, who could uh, change uh, shape. In Greek uh, mythology, Proteus, uh, which means uh, first, the firstborn or the primordial, was a god of the sea who uh, could predict the future, although, uh, although he changed uh, form frequently to avoid having to do this. Uh, this is where the noun proteo comes from, which refers to some uh, who frequently change opinions and affections, and the adjective protean, uh, like that resurfaces and expands through the expression, the expression of new forms. In modern times, the Swiss uh, psychologist, psychiatrist uh, Carl Jung defined the mythical figure of Proteus as a personification of the unconscious who uh, talks to thanks to, he, uh, to his gift of prophecy and shape shifting uh, has uh, much in common with the central figure of alchemy, which is the god Mercury. So this is the story behind the elephant man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta. You can perhaps go through it and then if yeah. people would like to write the number, and then we will go back, certainly. Marta, I think what I really appreciate is the 3D quality that you seem to get in these collages. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and, and some of them really, they made me laugh out loud, um, <laughs> which is unusual for collage. Um, um, yeah, I think, I think when I saw the advert for this, um, this event, 
it said, what are you enthusiastic about? And before I pushed down to see what, what, what people were saying, it got, what are you enthusiastic about? And I thought, what am I enthusiastic about? And I thought, collage. And then I scrolled down and I realized that this was a collage event. So I was, I thought, well, I must, I must sign up for this. So I really appreciate the, the images that you've done. The, um, I, I, yeah, number three and number eight, they really made me laugh out loud, strangely, <laughs> but, but it's, it's some sort of quality of, of being, of entering into the image that you seem to grasp. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much for the comment. So I was wondering if maybe Marta, you would like to write down as far as I was able to, to grasp, it's number three and number eight. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you comment on that? But also, if others would like to take part, uh, yeah, you could join the discussion or write us in the chat. Mm -hmm. Also, Ali, if you would like to say something or ask something, please feel free to take part. I think I just want to know the story behind every single one, which is not very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think my question is, which one is your favourite, Marta? Like, which which one do you like the best? I would love to know, and, and why? Mm, it's very difficult for me to... I know, choose. it's probably like asking you to choose children, isn't it? So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's also, as long as I have been, like, for seven years doing analog collage, it, it's, or it depends a lot on on the moment of my life that I've been doing each collage because uh, have you seen in, as you have seen in the gallery, the, there is a great number and, and, a, and a great mix. So uh, in each like period, I tend to do things in one way and then uh, in another period, I tend to do them in a different way, not only in an, in an artistic way, but also depending on the moment of my life I was going through or my mood or whatever. So for me, all of them means like something very personal uh, to me. And um, I believe that the, what I said before that sometimes I just do it uh, like in an unconscious uh, way or uh, mixing things by chance. And it's then afterwards that the meaning comes. So I find, I find that very like, um, how do you say, um, um, uh, that shows a lot about my my inner uh, side that maybe it's difficult to express in in a different way but through collage i i find i can express it maybe it's my interest in science maybe it's my interest in art in in brain in all together that they sort of mix uh, like in a smoothie and <laughs> there you go <laughs> with the collage so yeah it's difficult to choose it depends on uh, uh, each period of my life this is the the third one you said before and this is the eighth one no 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 no, no there's the numbered ones the numbered ones later not... later on Martha. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah, the, the, the number three, this one is the number, no, sorry, hold on. Not yeah. the slide, the number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Sorry. This one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Third one? one. Yeah. Yeah, this one, <laughs> this one is, uh, is uh, about uh, Sicily. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and the Messina, the Messina Pass. Uh, which is after uh, the legend of Estila. And uh, well, it's, it's an interesting uh, legend and it uh, explains why it's so difficult to uh, build a bridge uh, between uh, Italy, Calabria and Sicily because the sea is very wild and there is a, it's a very narrow uh, pass. So in the ancient times, uh, ships, uh, when they were trying to avoid one part of the corridor, they will crash through the other part of the of the pass. So the legend of Sila, it's, it explains all this. And well, uh, in, in my Instagram, there are all the explanations if you want to, to read oh. them uh, for, for not boring you. <laughs> oh. But yeah, it's it's interesting, and this is this this uh, is a Sila that she was converted in in a rock 
which is one of the sites of the of the of the Messina Pass in Sicily, and the other site is another monster that he was converted in a rock uh, to, which his name is Charybdis. <laughs> so this oh. is mythology again. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and the, the the eighth one that you said, yeah, uh, is uh, this one. Yeah, uh, yeah. This one is about uh, um, uh, the Japanese uh, poetry, which is called haiku, mm -hmm. and uh, also about the the language of of uh, people uh, with uh, that they are deaf. So there is a connection between this type of uh, poetry that tends to try to freeze like a moment of, of reality, uh, but also has like a movement counterpart, like moving the hands uh, up or down. And uh, I found very interesting, interesting the connection of this um, Japanese poetry with uh, the, the, the deaf uh, people language counterpart. And, um, also the relationship between language and movement that has like a different dimension. Uh, and here it's all together in, 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 in this concept of haiku. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can see that Susie, your microphone is unmuted. If you wanted to take part, please feel welcome. <laughs> okay, well, it was by accident. Thank you. And I will read uh, questions from the chat or comments. Um, so I'm going to read two of them. I think they're currently in the chat. And then um, I would like Marta and Ali to, to respond. Um, hi, I would like to know if there is first the story of the collage, or do you make the collage and find the story to it afterwards? Thank you. There's one more. Could you please also comment on number 26? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for there's, the questions. I apologize, yeah. there's some more, it's the third. Oh, okay. <laughs> Curious to know more about your working process. Do you start with any, any images you have around or do you have a set team in mind from the outset? Yeah, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, related to the first one, uh, um, as I explained before, there is like no uh, pre-established order. Uh, sometimes uh, I do the collage uh, because I find the combination of elements or images uh, says something to me or I find it uh, aesthetically matching. And sometimes afterwards uh, I do uh, research and many times there is like a match between what I find and what I have done in the collage uh, before. And sometimes it's the other way around. Maybe I like an idea or an, a concept, uh, like maybe the one of the elephant man, then, then it comes to me um, first the idea and then the, the, the collage. And uh, sometimes uh, it's nothing like that. It's just a, co a combination of images that I find aesthetically or visually uh, attractive and has no interpretation at all. And um, regarding to the, the second, uh, the, the third question, I think it was if, if I had like a sort of images uh, uh, or something like that uh, to make the, the collage. Uh, as, as long as I just do analog collage, I don't do any digital collage. And the reason why I do um, analog collage is what I explained before that I like the concept of finding the object or maybe the object finding me. And uh, um, I think that maybe um, on digital collage, uh, Mm, the, the, it's less uh, spontane spontaneous uh, the, 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 the act of finding an image because you Google it and you can find thousands of images. And uh, apart from that, I respect uh, and admire many collage artists that do a uh, digital collage, but in my case, it's just analog. So I choose, I have like um, 
different uh, magazines, uh, old ones, new ones. I have uh, some from the from 1930 or the 60s that, uh, as I said before, I, I found them in, in flea markets uh, in Madrid, in Berlin, in places I travel. And I have also magazines, uh, like a sort of magazines. And from time to, to time, I just get new material to refresh uh, uh, the inspiration, but I have no, no like uh, nothing like pre, uh, pre prepared or cut from before. And um, the other question was about a, a certain collage, wasn't it? Uh, yes, uh, number 26. Yeah, and yeah. in the meantime, we got two questions asking you for number six. So number yeah. 26 and number six. Number six, okay. So this is the number six, yeah. You want me to talk about this one or? Yeah, yeah. well, this this one is, is called the Blank Space and uh, it was inspired by a song uh, which is called In the Blank Space uh, by Josin, which is the singer that I like a lot. And uh, um, first of all, it was the inspiration of, of, the, of the lyrics. Uh, and afterward, uh, I found it that there is a blank space that is called Ma in, in Japanese uh, culture again. And this blank space is about the space in between things. So sometimes uh, it's more important, not just the things, but the space, the empty space between them, that is what defines the shape of the things. So in this way, the Japanese, they have like many examples of these, like they have a name for calling like the space in between the leaves of a plant or, or whatever. And um, there is also a, a word uh, to uh, explain the distance between fighters. So it's uh, about the, the, the distance between things and the space the empty space, blank space between things that defines them. And the other collage was the number uh, 20, uh, sorry, my, my, can you remind me please? 26. 26, uh, one minute please. Um, no, hold on. This one, yeah, this one is about uh, the, the Cyclop, the Cyclop uh, um, uh, legend, and it's very interesting. Uh, this one, let me check the story with a little more detail because it's very interesting. What what is the real counterpart? I I I like like the real counterpart that is behind mythology. So uh, this one, one minute. Yeah, this is uh, about Polyphemus, the, the Cyclops. And, and according to the Greek uh, mythology, the Cyclops were a race of uh, giants, very uh, irascible uh, and with a single eye in the middle of the forehead. Uh, hence their name Cyclos, which um, means circle in Latin and oops, oops, that means I. And um, there is a paleontologist uh, called uh, Othenio Abel at the University of Vienna that in 1914, uh, he proposed the theory of the legend of the Cyclops originated from the observation and misinterpretation of fossil remains of mammoth skulls found accidentally by the Greeks in caves, especially dwarf mammoths. Uh, tale, uh, tales um, like the elephant's falconry are in the, uh, what was a Indian elephant uh, that uh, uh, lived uh, between one and two million years ago. And these elephants colonized some Mediterranean islands such as Sicily, Malta, Sardinia, Crete, or Cyprus. So during the ice ages, the lower sea level brought the islands 
closer to each other, uh, some even link by land bridges. As elephants are good swimmers, it would not have been difficult for them to cross the distance between the mainland and the islands and settle on them, experiencing changes in their anatomy over the time. Due to low av availability, availability of food resources in the islands with respect to the mainland, they gradually became smaller in a process called dwarf dwarfism from dwarf uh, in English, giving rise to the dwarf species, elephas, falconery, and other varieties related. So it was a small elephant uh, uh, with, a, with a skull that was, was larger than that of a human skull with a rougher and stronger appearance uh, and with the particularity that the large opening in the front through which the muscles of the, of the, of the um, of the, of the, how do you say, of the proboscis of the, of the of Trump, uh, which have, uh, which have been mistaken for a large orbit. So the, these, these ancient Greeks, uh, when they saw the skulls, they, they thought that the hole where, where the, the, the Trump was, uh, it was uh, the, the orbit of a single eye. So as the trunk does not, does not have bones, it will be very difficult for an inexperienced person to deduce that this animal had a trunk and, and not a large frontal eye, especially if they had never seen an animal of this species before, uh, which had already become extinct. So uh, this is the, the, the story about the, the, the cyclops, which are really mammoths. <laughs> So we have received one more um, suggestion. If you could please comment on number nine. Yeah. Nine, yeah. Yeah, th this is a, uh, this is a, um, uh, how do you say in English? Um, this uh, kind of cloth that has this uh, embroidery, which is called, um, do you know how to call this type of cloth? Um, is it a type of a lace? Is yes, like exactly. Yeah, that, that's the, the word lace. So the, there is a, a, technique, a technique of lace in, in Spain uh, called uh, encaje de bolillos. Uh, and this uh, technique, also refers, uh, is an expression like to say something that it's been very difficult to achieve because mm, the technique is supposed to be so difficult and there are few mm, people that they do it uh, still nowadays, old women normally, that that is the association between the, the embroidery technique and when something it's uh, very, very difficult to achieve. So it's an expression I say in Spanish. <laughs> we have one comment also um, looking at all the work that you have done these past seven years. Are there any common themes that you think reoccur in your work? Yeah, sure. The the flying things, uh, the things uh, about flying, the things about freedom, the things about the, uh, yeah, about the um, uh, philosophy, science, psychiatry, women, much more than men. <laughs> Most of collages are inspiring in women. And yeah, nature, I think there are my main influences and all these surrealistic world <laughs> in my head. I have to somehow comment on the comment and your answer. Um, yeah, sure. While I was just getting to know your work, I also noticed that women are more present. So that was one of my questions, actually. If you could say a few words on how do you see the connection, perhaps. Uh, about being more women than men? Yeah. I think it, it's um, maybe something aesthetic 
that I tend to find more images that I aesthetically like um, of women or maybe because women are more represented in magazines or media that historically than men are. But well, um, there are some like the Cyclops uh, or the Elephant Man that they also talk about men. But I think it's basically because they are more available in, 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 in material way of talking. I was also wondering what, what Ellie commented in the beginning in terms of Ellie, when you were just sort of um, engaging with the topic of enthusiasm, um, this gender, as you were explaining, were something that you were noticing. Um, and yeah, I was just wondering if you have some thoughts on, on whether this is something that you still think or this is something that you thought at some point, but maybe. Um, yeah, what are, what are your reflections now on the way? Jennifer, um, I, I, I think I've just gotten further that way. <laughs> I think I've gotten further in, in ranting about it um, because I really do think it's so much of it is gendered. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that I really want to explore more because I think there's and there's been some really interesting studies about kind of, there's a lady called Sasha Judd who does a lot of kind of work in the tech sphere uh, in leadership and management in, in tech and she's done loads of talks invoking fandoms for example uh, the One Direction fandom or um, TV show fandoms she's done a lot of, of work on, on that in, in how that can help um, improve things in the corporate sphere um, so yeah I think if anything I just think it's more strong now than ever um, and it's something I'm yeah not qualified in at all but something that really interests me um, for sure. <laughs> 